Of all the neighborhoods in St. Louis, there is one that stands above all others in both fame and height. It's the 50 quirky square blocks of Italian tradition and pride known as the Hill. In the early 1900s, they actually had everything that they needed here. So it was not uncommon for people to never have gotten off of the Hill in the early years. Five generations of Italian Americans have made their home here. But thanks to the draw of its popular restaurants and markets, the Hill is one of the most visited neighborhoods in St. Louis. And it wasn't cool to be Italian until the Godfather came along, right? <laughs> and then for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, for all the wrong reasons, exactly. But the Hill is popular for all the right reasons. And now its rich history has been documented by Lynn Marie Alexander, who was born and raised on the Hill. Her big new book about St. Louis's Little Italy looks both backward and forward to a place where faith, family, and even fame are all part of the traditions that endure and evolve. It looks like this, this is ever-changing, but in reality, this is a slow process that's been going on since the beginning of the Hill. Lynn Marie Alexander, thanks very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. The book is great fun. It's um, oh, a heavy it's not a heavy topic, but it's a heavy book. <laughs> it's a big coffee table book. Reedy Press did a really good job with it. It's just gorgeous. Yes, it's fantastic. It would be an ornament on any coffee table in St. Louis or, or otherwise. Right. Uh, and, of course, it's all about the hill. But why is the hill called the hill? Well, if you've ever started on Manchester and tried to make your way to um, Sublet Park, you would know very, very well why it's called the hill. <laughs> I can't tell you, even even as little kids, you'd get to a point where you'd be riding your bicycle up the street and suddenly, like, oh, you'd have to get off and walk up the rest of the way. So it is indeed on a hill. And at the top of the hill is the um, Missouri um, institution, medical institution. And that is the highest point in the city of St. Louis. So there really is a hill because a lot of people yes. go and they say, well, I didn't I didn't see any hill. It doesn't seem like it's on a hill. It is. <laughs> They just haven't walked it right. <laughs> well, don't they have a big like a soapbox derby or something that takes advantage of the, yes, the hilly terrain? Yes, it, that comes down Macklin Avenue, and it is such good fun. And I those those some of those cars make it up to thirty thirty five miles an hour going down without any anything except for the momentum of the hill. So yeah, it's it's definitely a hill, and the soapbox derby itself is so, oh my gosh, it's so much fun to watch. So that's why they call the hill the hill. But why yes. did so many Italians end up settling in the hill? Were they Italians who were here already and then just kind of made their way there? Or were they mostly immigrants coming and somehow got there? There were some Italians here already. But um, the, the initial group that came settled um, in this area because of the, uh, the, the clay deposits. So they were miners. And they were recruited by companies to come over and be cheap labor, if you will. And they settled here because they were close to the mines, which were within walking distance. And, and they settled in this community. And then they began to bring over their fellow villagers and um, relatives. And so as, as in any immigrant community, um, when, you, when you start to get a, a cluster, then they start bringing their own with them. And so it becomes... Um, uh, re interrelated in terms of families, in terms of um, long-standing business relationships. So it's a very networked community. Was there a sort of a, an Italian diaspora at some point where they kind of all came in mass, or did they sort of trickle in through the years? Um, it came in phases, if you will. So the, a big chunk came from the Lombard region outside of Milan. They came from the 1890s until about the 1920s. And uh, later on, then another phase came, and the Sicilian this, that you now find on the hill, the Sicilians actually settled closer to the river, and they were they had different industry. They were involved in produce industry, for example. They had their own church as well, their own little cluster, and they experienced just demographic push and pressure. So from from there, they moved on to the hill thinking they're with like Italians. Um, so initially it didn't work out so well, the two communities together, but they worked out their differences, their cultural differences, and um, we, we get along now just fine. 
what was the hill like in the very early days? I guess you had all these clay mines because they were making bricks. What was the neighborhood like? They had everything that they needed here. They became a self-enclosed community. So we had our grocers and our taverns as well as the church. They didn't have to go anywhere else. In the early 1900s, it was not uncommon for people to never have gotten off of the hill in the early years. And and so that I think that helps keep that tradition and that habit, I think, keeps us from, um, keeps us still as a community, a, a, combi- a, a condensed community. Well, they certainly didn't need to go anyplace else to, to get a good meal. No, that's right. That's right. <laughs> or a market. Well, there, are yeah. a lot of, there are a lot of little markets there, too. Yes, yes. There, there, there used to be quite a few more markets. But um, I think, you know, the, the, just the, the reality of supermarket chains has kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the same, same dynamic that happens in a lot, a lot of small towns um, happened here as well. So we do have some fabulous shops, though, that still import from Italy. And some, some of our sausage makers still use the same traditions that, that they've inherited from their great, great grandparents. So um, yeah, the, it's, a, it's a good place still to get some authentic food and to get some authentic Italian goods as well. Initially, when the area was settled, were there houses existing there, or was this kind of country, or you know, were there non-Italians living there, or was nobody living there? It was the country, pretty much, five miles from the Mississippi River, and it, there were some uh, farm here, some farms here. There, the River de Pere ran clean and clear, if you can imagine, before the mining companies came, and. They, when they settled here, they settled because of the mines. So there were some settlers here already. For example, the Germans were here. Um, the Irish were just west of us. Um, but for the most part, the hill was uh, just a big, huge open space that, that we filled up with houses through the years. Of course, today, there are all these narrow shotgun homes on these little slices of land. How did that develop? The way that they charged for the land property and for the plots was by house width. So the widths are, are re- fairly narrow, 30 to 35 feet wide, but the length goes up to 95 feet. So, so they were able then, they could build one room and then one room and then one room after successively in order to be able to accommodate when they had the money and when they, when they had more children to, to raise and more, a bigger family. I was fascinated when I was reading in the book and not only about the clay mines that kind of led to the development of the area, uh, but the tunnels that were left behind from that and how they were used over the years. <laughs> you know, I, I had a real epiphany a couple of years ago when I, I understood that during Prohibition, the tunnels were used, and I, but I never made the connection be, between the tunnels being used to transport sugar and to transport the, the finished product. And duh, they were miners. Of course, they knew how to build tunnels. <laughs> So the, for the most part, the tunnels now are closed. Um, they, there is one opening that's still there, but the family that owns that plot of land is pretty much cemented over it. And, and I think that you can get to a couple tunnels through people's like sub-basements. That's where they, that's where they put their vats to, to distill. Um, but for the most part, the, the tunnels are, are not, no longer accessible. It seems like some of those shotgun houses are disappearing now. I mean, there's still an awful lot left, but, you know, this whole, I guess they're not building big mansions down there on those narrow plots, but but they do seem to be going away a little bit. Does that concern you? We're of two minds about that. Um, the On the one hand, the reality is that some of these shotgun homes are well over 100 years old. In fact, the house that I live in is over 100 years old. And some of them were built with uh, timber from and materials from the 1904 World's Fair that was left over after the fair was deconstructed. So as a result, the houses, some of them are just really beyond repair. So there is going to be new houses. Um, the, what does get a little concerning is the size, sometimes the size of the newer houses, and sometimes they don't always look um, the same as the rest of the neighborhood. However, I was walking down the street the other day and realized that we've had different subdivisions over the years added on to the hill. So, for example, those great houses that are across the street from Barra Park with the, the elaborate brickwork and the terracotta, those houses were built after World War II. And so I could imagine, I could just hear in my mind, you know, my great-grandparents grumbling about those new fancy houses as opposed to their to their wooden shotgun house. So I think, um, 
I think when we sit in time, it looks like this this is ever changing. But in reality, this is a slow process that's been going on since the beginning of the hill. I guess if you had to identify the beating heart of the hill, it would have to be St. Ambrose Church. Absolutely. Which Without I didn't realize doubt. until I looked in the book that it was actually the second St. Ambrose Church. The first yes. one is burned down. Yes. Uh, tell us about St. Ambrose Church and the importance that it still plays in the community. It, 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 there's no other word to describe it more aptly than it is the anchor. It, everything, re, even if you're not Catholic, you can't help but get caught up in church-related activities. <laughs> so at some point, somehow, you're going to get drawn into something that the church is up to, um, whether it's their charitable works or um, their, their community activities. There's, there's always something that the church is doing to, to ensure a healthy and vibrant community. And, and it is a place of deep spiritual attachment for so many Catholics that, that are on the Hill. And this is the place where they were married, the place where they buried their, their loved ones, um, the place where they were baptized. So it's, it's etched into them. And additionally, going through old church records, this new church, um, every family on the Hill donated something. I mean, every family that was alive and living on the Hill when that church was built, donated some money to, to help it um, get built. So there was a program that they had where for five years, you would give a dollar a month. So that's $60, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when, you, when you're talking about a couple thousand people that didn't have any money, that was a lot of money. So they, th I think the other thing about the church that makes it such the anchor is that it is, it, it belongs to us. It's in our blood, if you will, that um, that we we built it. We own it. We lived in it. So I think that goes the same for the houses, why there's a deep, deep attachment for our houses as well. I was wondering when I was reading the book about what happened during and after World War II, we know that in St. Louis, like a lot of American cities, German street names were changed. There was a lot of additional prejudice against Germans. What about Italians, since they were also on the on the other side of the war? For for this neighborhood in specific, we we the the people really um, at first thought that Mussolini was doing a good thing for Italy in his very early years. He sort of was getting Italy's act together, if you will. But once he allied with Hitler, and people are the people here in the U.S were talking to their own families in Italy and understood what that meant to them and understood what the implications were, they were, they were very, they became extremely patriotic. And they, this neighborhood alone sent over a thousand men to serve in the army, uh, in the military uh, during the war. And some of those veterans are still alive and, and they, they come and they tell stories about their experiences. But in terms of the, um, uh, the prejudice it, that never comes up when I when I talk to the veterans that doesn't really come up that much and I think also that they were used to being sort of um, ha have have prejudiced um, comments made to them and, and experienced prejudice uh, for just for being Italian I mean it wasn't cool to be Italian until the Godfather came along right <laughs> And then for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, except for all the wrong reasons, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so they, they, and a, another reason why they were such an insular neighborhood. Um, but they, they really did rally around the cause. I mean, the, the recruitment and the, the women. Oh my gosh, the bandages that they sewed for the Red Cross. So this, it was a, it was considered. The war was considered to be, um, Amer They considered themselves to be Americans, and they were fighting on the side of America. And they hope to be able to help liberate Italy. As many of the restaurants as there are these days down there, were there a lot more back then? Actually, no. There, there were fewer restaurants then. Um, the tradition, the tradition of eating out, um, was not as prominent um, in, say, the fifties. So there were a couple well-known restaurants, and there were a few. Um, Places that offered both groceries and sandwiches and, and the like, but in terms of, of having a place like um, Favazas or or Charlie Gito's, those kinds of places were fewer than they are now. And are those places restaurants where people in the neighborhood eat today, or is it mostly people coming down to the neighborhood to eat there? Some of them are pretty expensive. Yes, <laughs> um, uh, probably a little bit, a little bit of both. 
All I can speak to that is my own experience in that going out for us was has always been a special event, a special occasion. We, if we wanted Italian food, we stayed home, right? <laughs> so, so that that was kind of it. Is that we had such great food at home? Why would you want to go out? And and also, if you want to go, to, why would you go to an Italian restaurant as well? Because you could get this, the the same thing at home and do do it as well as a restaurant could, or the way that you really liked it. Are there dishes that are available in restaurants on the hill that aren't available in other Italian restaurants anyplace else, or at least anyplace else around here? With with the advent of celebrity chefs, things like what we would call risotto, which everyone else calls risotto, <laughs> um, those were things that you might have found in a restaurant that, uh, um, on the hill that you wouldn't have found anywhere else except for in a home. That and polenta is another one, the, the cornmeal, right? But those have now become just so commonplace. Um, and just like toasted ravioli as well. I mean, we didn't make toasted ravioli in the home, but you could get it at Italian restaurants here on the hill. But now you can find them any, almost anywhere. Made famous by St. Louis. Yes, that's right. And made by accident, <laughs> right? By accident, yes, yes. So a cook, um, the the bottom line about the who, who invented toasted ravioli, the bottom line, and simplifying it tremendously, is that the two restaurants shared a cook. And so this cook is the one who actually made the mistake of uh, dropping um, uh, raw ravioli into uh, oil instead of boiling water and pulled it out and served, dusted it with some Parmesan cheese and served it as a bar snack. And so then it became popular and what a great way to, um, uh, to get people to drink more beer. <laughs> so <laughs> so, that, so uh, it just it's kind of flourished from there. Bocce ball, which I know now is called bocce ball. Thank you, yes. <laughs> it reminded me in the book, I used to play a little bocce ball when I called it bocce ball and then got schooled on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that the only place in town in St. Louis where you can play bocce ball? There's a couple of clubs down there, right? Uh, yes, there, there's, well, it's the only happening place in town that you can play real bocce. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So we have we have two major places where you, where you can go to play bocce. Um, the first is Milo's, which has two bocce courts in its back patio, okay. and they offer leagues. And then there's also the Italia America Bocce Club, which is a members only club, but their their bocce courts are uh, internationally uh, standard. So they actually have international competitions once a year that come and they play in their courts. They are far more serious about their bocce than, than we are. <laughs> I mean, than we are at Milo's. Well, and speaking of sports, I guess we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about uh, Elizabeth Avenue, one particular <laughs> block of Elizabeth right. Avenue that produced some right. rather remarkable uh, sports figures whose names people still know today. Talk about that, because even the street name itself has been augmented to reflect that. Yes, yes. So Elizabeth Avenue has been renamed the Hall of Fame Place, and it's two two of its most notable um, residents, former residents, were Yogi Berra and Joe Garagiola, and they lived across the street from each other. So Yogi uh, won ten World Series rings as a, a player and manager, and Joe Garagiola went on to become a game show host. Um, he was a, also a cardinal. I have to, you have to give him that first. <laughs> he was a, a baseball cardinal. And then he went on to become a game show host. And he also was on uh, a guest host for the Johnny Carson show. And of course, another famous sports name from that same street didn't play sports, uh, notably, but certainly uh, made sports more interesting was Jack Buck. Yes, Jack Buck also lived on that street. And there's a fourth person on that street as well who was a professional athlete, uh, ben Pucci, who played at one time for the Cleveland Browns. So the way that you can know which house they are is that between the the street and the sidewalk, there are plaques, bronze plaques that are on the in the cement there. And it says, you know, who lived there in their years and what they were famous for. It's called the Hill Walk of Fame. And there are plaques throughout the hill um, uh, noting where these famous people lived or these accomplished people lived. Do most of the people who live on the hill now, are they still Italian? We're kind of losing that majority, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I'm not sure which, because the people that do live here now on the hill are equally committed to it as a neighborhood. So 
the 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 network though hasn't gone away. That network that I was speaking of earlier, where we're intermarried and 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 have business partnerships that go back generations. So some of the families are working on their fifth generation now here on the hill, and so that part of it um, isn't isn't going away. Their kids are if they've moved away, they're coming back and they're buying buying homes and building homes on the hill. There was a time when a house would go up for sale on the hill and it was snapped up like that. Is that still the case? Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> we hear it all the time. And and what happens is that I guess especially in right now in, in this these past few years, um, people have money to spend. And so there's actually competitive bidding that goes over the asking price for these houses. So, yes, they they go up very they get they get bought up very quickly. The Hill, through the years, has had to face all kinds of challenges, including the challenges of urbanization and suburbanization, which they successfully fought. Yes, yes. Um, I think, too, that that speaks to coming back uh, to to the Hill. The Like the example, I'll use myself as an example, is that having grown up here, you, you just don't, you, you want to come back to home. And I think that helps fight off the suburbanization, if you will. But living in the city is becoming trendy also. And this is a this is like a sort of happy compromise, you know, that it's a safe place to be and you can still walk alone at night on the street and or you know go for a walk or walk your dog and not have to worry about anything. So it's it's a it's a safe place to be. Um, in terms of urban blight, is that when the, in the 1970s through the 1990s we, we did fight that off, and, and I, much of that has to go to Monsignor uh, Polizzi, Sal Polizzi. He, he was doing, did his master's degree in um, urban studies, if you will, and he helped fight the, um, or, or at least keep the community together when Highway 44 came through. Yeah, tell and, that story because that's fascinating how, I mean, that could have been, you know, an, an existential, I guess it was an existential threat for the, the neighborhood that they've fought off with kind of an ingenious compromise. Yes, yes, they did. The, the The highway was coming through whether we wanted it to or not. So the challenge was for the Hill is how to manage that. And the, the way that they did that is they uh, used good old healthy Catholic shame <laughs> and a lot of industrious fundraising. And so they the, the 90 homes were, were lost. But in the meantime, then they raised money to, to, to fight for a, a car bridge as well as a pedestrian bridge. So that way the people that were stuck on the other side, um, away from the church, would have easy access. They didn't have to, they could walk over and go to church of the morning or go to their bakery or whatever. And the way that we got that is that the community raised $50,000 and took it took the fight to Jefferson City with four busloads of people. And then after that, then went to Washington, D.C. So Monsignor took a, a group of in, influential people from DC, to, from here to D.C. And it happened to be the transportation secretary. His last name was Volpe, V-O-L-P-E instead of V-O-L-P-I. So that helped a lot. <laughs> and what also then the, the national press picked up on the story of this tiny little community fighting, fighting this federal highway that's coming through. And so we got a lot of sympathy um, and support across the nation for the fight that we were fighting. So as a result, we do have both a car bridge and a footbridge that goes over the highway. How is the Hill doing these days? Very well. It's doing. It's it's thriving actually. There's a. Um, it's it's so fun. For the first time that I can remember in pretty much my entire life, the block that I live on has young kids on it. So the the there has tr- been truly a generational change on the hill, and it's gotten significantly younger, and and that's that's great because that's a lot more energy that's that's put into all things hill related. Um, mutual aid societies, the church, the schools, um, different uh, fundraising events. So we're doing, yes, I think the Hill is doing very well. It's very, it's healthy. One of the neat things about the book is you have a lot of personal stories in there, which made me wonder if uh, you're concerned that there is some institutional memory that's going to be lost over the next few years as a lot of these people pass away, the, the stories in your book notwithstanding, of course, that a lot of these stories will be lost to time. Well, that's the job of the Hill Neighborhood Center, and, and that's why we have an archives, so that we can we can try to, to preserve some of these older memories, and 
I think that we could do a better job of it. And I think part of it is that there's a certain shyness and a certain idea of you don't promote yourself. There's That's within the culture here. And I think people are reluctant to talk about their personal personal histories very much. I mean, I've asked dozens of people if they would just sit down with me and, and record and I could record them. And they're, they're very shy to do so. And so I think that's a little bit of a concern. However, um, the documentation that we have is is fabulous. So we know if we don't have it in, in the, the personal words of, or the personal video of someone, um, we do we do have it in uh, all of our documentations and the photographs and the newsletters that have been going since the Second World War. So you know there 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 is going to be some, but I think that that is also just the, the nature of the beast of any community that's over a hundred years old. You know there are so many cities that still have a little Italy someplace. Yes. But most of them are hardly anything like they used to be. But St. Louis's Italian neighborhood, the Hill, is very much like it used to be. Why has it prospered and thrived all these years when so many others have not? One of the more obvious, but it's so obvious you don't even think about it, is the, the geographic boundaries of the St. Louis's neighborhoods. You know, so, so St. Louis is, is plotted and I think there's what 87 neighborhoods within the city limits and so we have a very distinct border and I think that in itself creates a community um, it, it creates a place that you become automatically a part of because you live within that border and then the other things that have made us so healthy over all of these years it goes back to everything that we've just talked about the the entrepreneurial spirit the ethnic heritage the Catholic faith, the anchors of the church and all of our mutual aid societies that still exist today, the families, the networks of families that are here, all of that, it just, is, it just happens to be um, a, a fabulous coincidence and a blessing to all of us for, for being here and living here. Well, it sounds like it's going to go on for a long time, and certainly preserving it through your book is uh, one way that the memories of the Hill will continue for Ever and ever, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Lynn Marie Alexander, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you.